afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, my dear colleagues. I would like to welcome you all to the Women in Business event on behalf of the EBRD. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for attending our event today. I would like to also I would also like to thank our moderator, panelists, and award winners, because the panel, as you know, will be followed by handing over the awards to the winners. And so everyone is cordially welcome here. We will start with a discussion panel titled Knowledge Economy, Women in the Know which will be followed by questions and answers to give you all the opportunity to participate in the discussion. We will then have the award ceremony, as I mentioned, to honor some outstanding achievements by women in business among EBRD clients. Finally, after the discussion and award ceremony, there will be a reception with an opportunity, so something more material, reception with an opportunity for you to network and exchange views. In fact, this is our 11th Women in Business panel discussion and we have presented the Women in Business Award since 2005. Over the years, this has become one of the most interesting and well-attended events at the annual meetings. I am pleased to see that we are continuing this tradition today with an esteemed panel and keen audience to engage in a lively discussion. The, B the EBRD has been addressing gender equality issues for several years. In 2009, we adopted the Agenda Action Plan to reaffirm our commitment to gender. We have done that by taking specific and proactive actions to promote equal opportunities among men and women and women's empowerment in our investments and technical cooperation projects. We have worked on promoting access to finance and women entrepreneurship and improving equal opportunities in the workplace in our investee companies and banks. We have also helped ensure that the benefits of the bank's projects are equitably distributed among women and men in the community. This year, our Women in Business panelists focused on challenges facing women in the knowledge economy. As we all know, increasing numbers of women in the EBRD region are earning graduate degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. However, men still dominate the knowledge-intensive industries that draw on this talent pool. The topic is indeed relevant to our region, especially in the view of the recent economic crisis, which has forced many countries to search for avenues to revitalize their economies. Innovation through knowledge economy can be a catalyst for this revitalization. We have very distinguished panelists and moderators today, and I look forward to a dynamic, very alive, and very open discussion on the impediments to female participation in the knowledge economy and ways to capitalize better on women's potential as innovators, entrepreneurs, and industry leaders. Let me now introduce our moderator, Isabel Matheson. Mrs. Matheson is the director of Media at SAFE, the children, and the former BBC correspondent in East Africa. So it's a pleasure for me to hand over the word and the, to Isabel to start her job. So, Isabel, the floor is yours. Okay. And I'm sure that panel will be a fantastic event and then the discussion which follow fantastic as well. So let's enjoy it. So I, I just want to echo those comments just to say I'm, I'm really delighted to say we have a, an exceptional panel here. 
women from lots of different walks of life, actually, and different uh, parts of the world as well. Um, but it's a very distinguished and knowledgeable panel about women in the know. And some, we have people here who are truly pioneers, and I think uh, we'll hear some of that come out in the discussion. Um, just before we start, I've been asked to give a couple of housekeeping notes. So we will have an active question and answer uh, session through uh, our discussion. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, but could you please raise your hand and wait until the microphone comes to you so that everybody can hear and the translations can be made as well. Seated at your table is also a facilitator, or, or on most tables there's a facilitator, um, and you can address questions to that facilitator or during the question and answer session, uh, you know, address them to the panel. Um, and the final housekeeping note is the usual one, which is please switch off your mobile phones, because I think we'll have plenty of interesting a discussion in the room and we don't need to be disturbed by mobile phone calls. So that would be very helpful. So I just wanted to introduce first of all our panel. So starting on the right, uh, Liliana Kundakovic. Liliana is uh, currently the managing director of the Serbian Innovation Fund. Uh, she tells me that's a newly established government fund uh, that aims to support innovative companies. And she's just been telling me that between 30 and 40% of those projects that they funded have senior representation of women in senior management levels in those startup companies, which is great news. Uh, Liliana, also very interesting background. Uh, she held a research position at the Center for Space Research in MIT in the States, and she has a PhD in chemical en engineering. Uh, Rosa Otunbaeva. Uh, um, a real pioneer, first woman president of uh, the Kyrgyz Republic, um, and someone she tells me that during her time in power and afterwards has really promoted um, women in positions of power and uh, very much encouraging women to diversify away from uh, traditional employment sectors into the non-traditional sectors. And that's something I know she's very keen to speak to here today. Uh, Baroness Lindsay Northover uh, is the coalition spokeswoman on international development in the House of Lords. Uh, she tells me that the government here is very interested in how the bank is promoting this issue and making sure that the bank, the benefits of the bank uh, flows equally to both women and men and that's something that she's very keen to see and to encourage. Olga Derganova, um, another first. We have uh, the first female chair of Microsoft in Russia and the CIS, where she was very much promoting the role of the software industry. And now she's hopped over into the banking sector, where again she tells me that compared to when she started out in business, there's a lot more women in senior positions, and maybe that's something she can reflect on as well. And uh, finally, Ayla Sivand. Uh, from Turkey, um, a real entrepreneur in our midst, uh, founded four startup IT companies, I think, and she tells me that she actually has the oldest IT company in Turkey and that her daughters are now heavily involved in running them, her daughters having engineering degrees, um, and that she indeed is a former vice president of the Women Entrepreneurs Association of Turkey, not a great surprise there, I think. So that is our panel today. And what I've asked them to do, first of all, is just to give us a brief summary from, from their own points of view and their own experience of what they think the challenges and opportunities for women in the know actually, actually is. So if we could start, first of all, with Rosa. How do you see this issue, Rosa? Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, for ladies and gentlemen. I do believe that um, in our countries in Central Asia, and so first of all in my country, uh, for, to turn over to uh, such uh, um, industries like uh, mining and uh, power energy, which uh, generates uh, the national wealth, uh, we should uh, um, bring up uh, the young generation of women because uh, the old one, uh, they've been educated in Soviet time and uh, we used to have uh, famous uh, geologists, uh, the heads of the geology uh, par of parties and uh, uh, groups and uh, uh, 
uh, in the energy sector also. So I would say that uh, after 20 years of deterioration, social uh, uh, problems uh, of this uh, jump transition, we badly need today uh, to uh, bring up again uh, from this interest uh, to the uh, to, to those main uh, industries. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, we have uh, women uh, studying in the universe, a lot of them, but they go to the trendy professions like diplomats, bankers, f financial uh, f workers. But uh, I, would, uh, um, I would stress that uh, we should uh, build up interest of children, women, toward to those, uh, the main industries. So Liliana, you actually have a degree in uh, engineering, um, so you are not in the category that uh, Rose is talking about. What, how do you see the, the importance of education here? Um, uh, well, I, I was lucky enough to spend a long time in the US, in Boston area, where everybody is doing something new, where knowledge economy is not even a question, and where... Uh, uh, you have human capital colleagues and everybody that is eager to work with you on something new. Uh, two years ago, I came back uh, to Serbia trying uh, to establish an innovation fund. And uh, one of the challenges was finding financing for it. But the major challenge was a lack of skilled workers. And what I mean by that is Serbia is actually very good in enrollment in science and engineering. 49% of researchers uh, are women. However, uh, making that step from science and engineering degree to actual business, and even further encouraging women to be entrepreneurs, um, it is very difficult. Uh, why? Uh, first thing, uh, first, First, that's a fear of unknown. What I realize is that most of the engineers and scientists, women engineers and scientists, do not know what it means to be in business. They do not know uh, uh, what it means uh, to run a company, uh, take care of the financials, what is the cash flow, etc., etc. So we do have issues, even though we have high uh, percentage of uh, women in engineering and science, we do have issue to encourage them uh, to move towards business. And that's one problem that a uh, very flexible and uh, educational system should address. Uh, in what way flexible? It has to be flexible in a way to enable engineer to also take business courses and uh, inquire about opportunities. What is needed, women typically do not realize what it means uh, to be a woman in business. Uh, if they finish a PhD degree, they will most likely end up in academia <coughs> as a professor researcher. Uh, we do have as a government to uh, enable, uh, to provide enabling environment for, for them to see opportunities. Second, as uh, many other countries, Serbia is also facing, in the region, Western Balkan region, I can say, it is also facing uh, uh, lower enrollment of students in science and engineering. And what is really important there, he, and Serbia has started working towards that, is uh, promotion of science. Science has to be interesting. Being an engineer has to be very rewarding. Science has to be promoted, it has to be around us, it has to be exposed. Serbia has started an initiative by for, uh, establishing a center for promotion of science. And I think it's very important that from early age, women actually get acquainted with what an being an engineer means, what is that behind the science. And as they grow and get accustomed to uh, being exposed to science, they can uh, better uh, comprehend what opportunities that bring. Thank you, Liliana. Um, Olga, do you want to just reflect on your experiences? Um, thank you. Look, um, by background, I'm the computer science engineer. And the first 20 years of my career, I spent at Microsoft 
first doing software development and then being the general manager and the chairperson for the whole region covering Russia and former Soviet Union. And when you look at the technology area, mostly software or hardware development, basically you don't see any inequality between the genders. If you are a good software engineer and you write good software code, it doesn't matter who you are, what race you are, what size you are, what gender you are in the end of the day. The difference comes when you grow up and you come from university and you need to commit your time, your skills and your ability to develop to the job you do. At a certain stage, the priorities change. And then the new priorities come, family, children, the other priorities. And then the basic question for any person in technology, if especially if you are a woman, basically the question is not how to become the engineer, not how to become the software developer or become the scientist, but how to keep your level of knowledge and cope with the pace of development around you. If you have a choice, between what book to read at night for your kid, the software developing language uh, book, or the book for your kid, uh, which one you would choose? If you are a good mom, no question. Most likely you will choose the book which you will read for your kid. And at that stage, you start losing the pace where you can really compete as a good software engineer uh, with the others who basically keep reading the software development book at night. There is nothing bad about that. And what's good about technology area, that if we speak about innovation, it's not only about developing software or coming up with a good idea. It requires a lot of other people assisting this idea to become the real solution, to become the real product, and basically come to the market and bring value to the clients. So in technology area, a lot of jobs which are performed by women come from software testing, from documentation writing, from uh, development of the other areas, from sales and marketing, and most important, the finance jobs, which you need to have in any business team for the innovation. Um, when I was moving away from technology into banking, I was quite surprised in the difference between how many people, how, I'm sorry, how many uh, women actually you can meet in software development area versus how many women you can meet in banking area. Look around. You have a lot of successful women sitting here. There's no gender inequality when you, it comes to banking. Basically, banking is full of bright, young, and ambitious women doing great job in, in, in other area. But what I also found out, that knowledge economy and ability of people to get right skills, especially when it comes from the fundamental science or engineering, uh, actually work well in both industries. When I was at Microsoft, I kept hiring people with a fundamental science background. And the best software developers usually come from universities with math and physics background. You will not actually believe how many skills like that are required these days in risk management and banking, in financial analysis and banking, and in investment banking products if you need to develop them well. So when I moved into banking area, you won't believe I kept hiring the same set of skill sets for the jobs which I was doing now in my new role. And that basically gives the message to any person who is working in the knowledge economy that the level of education which you obtain during the time when you basically start becoming the pupil since the beginning will bring success to your career regardless of the gender and regardless of the place which you might take uh, in your future career role. And then uh, what really bothers me when I was moving from Microsoft into banking, that a lot of women which we can meet mostly met at the middle manager's position. There's less likely that you can meet a lot of women in the boardrooms. And again, there is a good uh, excuse for that. If you have to choose in this work-life balance equation, there is no basically equation there. Work always prevail the other part of equation. So there is basically no life when you start building your career, especially in banking or investment banking. And then we need to develop the certain approach which would help the young ladies and young uh, women to perform their jobs and become the boardroom members with a very special set of help, which 
if you're interested, I will probably answer later on. So, uh, you know, m much to think about there, especially, you know, how women it essentially juggle those home and, and work Absolutely. Uh, questions. Absolutely. Um, Isla, do you want to just reflect a little bit on how life looks for you as an entrepreneur within the knowledge uh, economy? Yeah, sure. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, I started the IT, uh, working in the IT 30 years ago, so it was quite unusual for women to, to work in this industry. But I didn't have any obstacles at all uh, in, in developing my business, uh, and we did well. We have a lot of women uh, working for the company, uh, developing software as well. But usually the jobs are very scarce on the market and it's more difficult for women to choose uh, engineering sciences for education because of the lack of jobs later on. The, it's a very demanding area. But coming to information technologies, at the moment we have 40% female employment rate for, for information technologies all over Turkey, whereas the general employment rate is much lower. So we have a higher demand for women, but as I said, it's a very demanding career, so there are a lot of women who prefer general studies instead of engineering or science. Mm -hmm. Baroness Northover. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, and, and perhaps I could take a, a more general approach. You've heard a lot about the, from the experience of the other panelists. Um, I'm a spokesperson, as Ishbel said, for the government in the United Kingdom for international development in the House of Lords. Um, and looking at this generally, there's obviously the, uh, the, the main point that it's, it's right that uh, both sexes should be um, equally involved, but it is also of economic importance, and that's, it's extremely important that this is recognised, the, the economic benefit of tapping all resources within a country, and that's both genders. And that's why uh, the Department for International Development very much stresses the importance of, of involving um, women and girls, making sure that education of girls is stressed as much as for boys, um, and their economic empowerment. And we're very pleased that the bank is seeking to mainstream that. Um, I note, uh, and, th and that's extremely important, I do note though that in the um, summary of what's happening today at this conference that this particular session uh, wasn't mentioned, uh, which causes me a little concern. And I also note that you all <coughs> recognise the importance of this, but I count here, or I counted here just now, 62 women and 20 men. Now, you all know how important this is. The bank is recognising how important this is. I think in a time of economic pressure, uh, countries, societies, firms will increasingly recognise that they need to draw upon the resources of their whole population. And I take that back to education, the need to make sure that girls as are as highly educated as boys. Now, in, in much of the region that the bank operates in, that's already the case, and that's very welcome. In the um, Middle East and North Africa, which it's moving into, uh, there are challenges there, and it's extremely important that that comes through. But I don't, I surely, to this audience, don't need to say that when you are educating girls and um, giving them that kind of economic empowerment, um, you, uh, you see smaller families, that the prosperity of the family improves, the prosperity of the society improves, the prosperity of the country improves. So it's a no-brainer, which is why uh, World Bank research and so on and so forth shows um, how you improve the productivity of a country by making sure you are tapping um, the, what both women as well as men can offer. Now, as I say, I'm sure the audience here knows that, um, but you only need to see the other members of the panel to see the potential benefits um, of that approach. So therefore, I would argue for gender mainstreaming. I am glad the bank is doing it. Um, 
Those of you who are perhaps seeking support from the bank, bear in mind that that is the way that uh, the bank is heading and also that it makes sense for your firm and your country if that is what you are doing too. Thank you. Um, quite a few of you mentioned education as being critical to, to getting the, this right. Um, I just wonder what should be done differently from what we're doing at the moment. Rosa, what about you? You were in a position where you could, have cha you could change things. What did you change practically in terms of being able to encourage women to get the right education and then go for the right jobs afterwards? Uh, I was enough uh, on the power, but uh, I was uh, three times foreign minister and uh, just one and a half years as president in a very critical time in, uh, mm. in the history of my country. And I was uh, actually a crisis manager, uh, couldn't uh, concentrate very much on this topic, but uh, I still I was able to, uh, to push very much uh, minister of education towards uh, to the um, uh, those exact sciences, fundamental sciences, uh, to mm -hmm. turn them. Because in our parts uh, uh, of the, of, uh, I would say exactly about my country, this uh, the deterioration of education brought uh, to the point that uh, teachers left their position. They would rather uh, to go to uh, trade and to do other businesses uh, because they couldn't earn their uh, money. So, and so there are a lot of schools where no maths, no sciences, and it is still the problem in my country, for example. Uh, when I came to London, uh, it, uh, it, it is again striking for me that you do not notice that you have a, a, such a museum for science and uh, technique for children. You have an aquarium, you have a planetarium. Unfortunately, we do not have those uh, uh, stuff in my country. And those are the basic which form up the interest of children and overall of people toward to, uh, to, the, to those, uh, 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 the, the science and to their uh, jobs which are uh, vital. I was pleased to learn uh, flying uh, recently via Istanbul that they built uh, uh, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful museum, aquarium. So, and uh, uh, Turkey, which is surrounded by so many uh, seas, now they have a, a very important institution which will build so much knowledge about this. So, I would stress on that, and I would say that uh, uh, we must uh, educate uh, for children properly on that, and so uh, we. Uh, I would say that so much investment been wasted until today, but why not uh, any bank, World Bank, Asian Bank, Islamic Bank, EBRD will give money for Museum of Science and Technique, for example, in our countries. This is important. It is more important than any uh, other investment which will be wasted uh, or whatever. So. <laughs> I would say that uh, it is important very much to, uh, for EBRD to build interest uh, over to, those, uh, to the science. For example, uh, L'Oreal company, together with UNESCO, they have very, very high uh, such a, a competition for women in the science. Why EBRD, which uh, focuses now on this topic, you should now also put forward such a um, no, such a high uh, level so, of um, concourse. So putting value on these value. areas is exactly. critical so women see the point of going into them and feel valued in, in their kind of career choices. I just wondered one thing that we haven't really touched on, we talked about the bank supporting but we haven't really talked about you know if women are interested in going into these areas, if they do want to start up, you know what are, are the particular problems they might face in terms of looking for financing, for example? Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Ida? Because you've had that first-hand experience. Well, I personally did not have any uh, problem in, in financing, but working with the Association for Women Entrepreneurs in Turkey, uh, we're doing our best to motivate and to develop women entrepreneurship in Turkey. And we, we are... We, we leave the difficulties they're going through. Financing uh, support is one of the barriers, 
But uh, before we come to the finance, it's really the traditional relationship set, uh, which is an obstacle for the woman to decide to go into her, uh, her own uh, business. And they are the uh, environment in which uh, she is found. She doesn't have many role models mm -hmm. and encouragement and motivation within the family or within the neighborhood mm -hmm. are quite crucial for her to, to think of starting up her business. And then education, we're, we finally, very recently, in 2009, we uh, closed the gender gap for primary school education. And this academic year, the female uh, students' participation rate at the university level has reached 45%. So we're doing better and better for education, but n never enough. Uh, another problem uh, they are facing is the shortage of the female employment rate in Turkey because we find that it's really from this pool, from the professional life that a woman evolves into setting up her own business. You don't, you know, after graduation from a college, you don't start up your business right away. You need some experience, you need a network, you need to clarify what you want to do so that you can write out a correct business plan. And uh, if she doesn't have a professional life, then it's very difficult for her to, to start up her business. So the, the pool of work, working uh, force, the labor force is crucial and that's where we're working very hard. We left, uh, I mean, the, the focus uh, is no longer for our association uh, to develop the women entrepreneur, but to, to increase the female uh, labor force first is because that's where from, from where we can derive the entrepreneurs and we're working very hard on that. And then, of course, comes, comes the financial support because for startups, there isn't any financial support whatsoever. But would it help, for example, Olga, if we had uh, special funds um, yeah. that were targeted um, towards women, specifically to promote yeah. them in this area? Would, would that help, do you think? Very much so. In fact, we're working with a local bank uh, which has activities in this area. They have a special women entrepreneur package, support package, uh, where they provide financing at very lower interest rates and for a very longer term, but not for startups. It's only for women entrepreneurs who want to develop their business, who want to grow their business. And it's very rare, maybe it's the only bank in Turkey who has this special package for women entrepreneurs. But for startups, we don't have any, any support at all. Olga? I might sound contradicting, but I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Especially in technology area, in the end of the day, you provide financing for the technology and not for the person who is leading the company. And it will be quite difficult, basically, to base the decision on financing on any other uh, differentiator than mm -hmm. the technology excellence. Mm -hmm. So then startup will not succeed. But when you come to the more traditional jobs, where you need to keep employment in the country with the other level, uh, with the other people and other level of education, probably that will be the particular case which might require support, mostly coming from the government, but rather than the, from the commercial institutions. Because in the end of the day, that's kind of the infrastructure development and development of the population and the workforce, rather than business opportunity and business investment. But when it comes to the business investment, I'd rather keep investing as a government or as a business person, I would rather keep investing in education and keeping the best practices which can be collected in fundamental science all across the globe. Russia is famous for its engineers, for its science, and the biggest problem which Russia is facing, even nowadays when uh, education is still at a kind of a high quality rate, the major problem which Russia is facing is a brain drain. So the moment you train good software engineer, you don't find this engineer in Russia anymore. So this engineer is employed somewhere else outside of Russia. And that's the reason why, in the end of the day, investments in education should be supported by the government in the investments of infrastructure and building the innovation economy within the country where you keep investing in education. So the famous pillars, investments, infrastructure, and innovation, so they're all similar for all the countries across the globe. So, so there is no good education unless you utilize people whom you train within the country. If you don't utilize them within the country, so then there will be no innovation in your country, and then you actually you start running all over again, 
not having uh, the right outcome of the investments you make. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, what kind of, you talk, that, that's a kind of broad picture, a broad problem. Um, you know, specifically looking at women, I mean, you talked about mainstreaming women. Should we have specific programs, um, you know, not thinking specifically about targeted funds? I mean, what, what practically could we do within governments or within our, our universities um, to support women more? Well, you've heard two different mm. um, perspectives yeah. there, um, with, with, with Ayla saying that it's, it's difficult, more difficult than men, to access the funds that are there, and, and Olga saying um, that there shouldn't be special funds targeted at women. But you can actually put those two together. You, you need to have, if, if you haven't got equal access to funds, then you need to do something special, because you need to give, in effect, women equal access to things. And that may mean that you have the special fund in order to get the entrepreneurs that you're not bringing through um, anyway. It's, it's um, a it, slightly, slightly different um, sort of instance, but I met a, a woman from West Africa the other day, and her father refused to let her be educated, pointing out endlessly that she was a girl, there wasn't any point, etc., etc. She is now a clothes designer. Not only is she looking after her immediate family, but she is actually looking after her whole extended family. Now, her father has the grace to say that in the end, it was worth uh, investing in her. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can see there, um, you've, you've got to counter uh, whatever inequality people may face in the first place. And therefore, there may be, there may be reason to target in those instances. So, Liliana, I was struck when we were talking earlier, you were saying that actually in Serbia and across the Balkans, there was a high number of women who were enrolling for science and engineering. That, that was a tradition. Um, it, the problems arose later. If you were thinking s separately within your context, what practical help could be done to bring th through more women? Uh, it would probably be more internships during the course of their regular um, uh, undergraduate studies. Internships that would bring them closer to the real business world and uh, give them opportunity to see what their career might be. I think that's what's lacking in the Western Balkan region at least. Mm -hmm. uh, I would strong mentors. Strong mentors and exposure mm -hmm. to the world around you. I mean, unfortunately, whole the region was, uh, uh, during the 90s, very much isolated. So that has consequences. Uh, it took long time now, uh, 12 years since the change, for country to actually open up to new ideas. But a certain period of time has passed. And I think that would help women in science and engineering in particular contact and uh, exposure to what other women do. Mm -hmm. um, I would also like to touch upon what Olga has started. Uh, it is a little funny, we started Innovation Fund year and a half ago, and we do have four babies. Uh, and to me, as a manager, it, it is a challenge. Because what I would like to do uh, uh, is bring those, uh, keep those women involved. I would like to have uh, flexible labor laws that would allow them to work part-time so they can stay in touch with what we are doing, they can stay uh, up to date to what's going on and not lose that one year, maybe year and a half uh, that they chose, have chosen to dedicate to their family and then lose uh, what they can have in, a, in their career. I think that's an important uh, issue, and that's where government can do a lot. Mm -hmm. Can I just take some questions from the audience now? Maybe either um, sharing your own experience, if you have uh, some experience that you'd like to share with us, or questions for the panel. Could you, could you wait for the microphone, but when you um, take it, just stand up, say who you are, and um, tell us who you would like to address your question to. Um, my name 
Is it working? Yes. Uh, my name is Nadine Abdul Wahab. I'm with the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies. Um, and my question actually builds off what was just commenting. Um, I think one of the issues that I've noticed over and over again is not necessarily a lot of the education questions puts the onus on women and not on the education system on the workplace. Making workplaces, and you said uh, um, very flexible labor laws, other than flexible labor laws, is when we're um, offering uh, assistance to corporations, is mandating that they have. Um, um, family and women friendly um, um, environments where people don't have to make the choice between the young family and working and keeping up like part time, like maybe um, um, uh, uh, babysitting or uh, uh, child care within the workplace and then also building uh, education or changing the paradigm around education. We are focused on the family, both for men and women to make that choice to continue their education while raising a young family because that's the, generally the time that they're doing that. And rather than just focusing on pushing women to do education and supporting them in the young entrepreneurship. It's important in that sense, but we haven't quite focused on what it means to be engaging in the system and what sacrifices they have to make. Okay, thank you. Down here. Just one second. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Marta Sigeti Boniford from the Regional Environmental Center for Central and Eastern Europe. I work in some of your countries, actually in Serbia and Turkey, so I have colleagues from there. But what is quite interesting, we are with Borbala, part of an education that started in 1990, that, and we got a degree, a management business degree. So in 1990, when you got via the George Soros Business School, an MBA, that was a very different perspective. And one of the things that we learned at that time, that unless we have what you, many of you have said, a supportive network, a network mm -hmm. of women who are able to help and with a strong men who are willing to take that also, that initiative up, it doesn't work. So we do have under the Hungarian Business Leaders Forum a network of talented young and older and always young women, and we are working together and bringing and sharing experiences, including mentoring, including uh, building it up into our business cases, wherever we are working. Mm -hmm. Now, I have two questions for the ladies, for all of you. <laughs> One of them is related to an, an issue that, uh, that many of the people that we are talking to are referring to the glass ceiling. Have any of you experienced a glass ceiling? Is there a glass ceiling? Are we making the glass ceiling? Or is the glass ceiling made for us? The second question I have is, do you believe in quota? Oh. Do you think that that's a useful tool to get from A to B? If yes, please share your experience. If no, I'm interested in that too. Thank you. Okay, so two very interesting questions. I think. I'd rather like to reframe it a little bit because glass ceiling is a, is a familiar topic for women in employment, but think about glass ceiling in this particular sector of the economy. Um, who, who, has it, who has bumped against the glass ceiling? Who would like to admit it? We were, I didn't bump, but we were speaking yes. about it today <laughs> because I, mean, I was talking about the employment, uh, women employment rate in Turkey, which is very low at 26%, yet all the studies carried out that we have a lot of women on the top management levels. And uh, for the private industry, the recent studies show that we have a 20% ratio in top uh, management levels and 14% as chairpersons. So compared with the EU average, this is uh, incredible. In the EU average, you have uh, an employment rate exceeding 60%, and yet uh, we have about 14% uh, on the board levels and only 3% as chairpersons. And Turkey comes after Finland uh, with uh, regarding the ratio of the chairpersons as women. Now, this is very strange because, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And when we look at it, we see that the main reason for this discrepancy is the strength of the glass ceiling in the Western world. Because the corporate models have been established so long time ago. They are very rigid. And it's, they form a very vertical pyramid for women to come to the top management levels. Whereas in a country like ours, where capitalism and the corporate models are 
recently, relatively recent, once you can make it somewhere, it's much easier to, to go up the ladder and become part of the top management because uh, there's, uh, the, the corporate models are not that rigid in, in this mm. country, especially in the finance. Uh, we were going, um, I mean, the women are the strongest in Turkey in the finance industry. So, and so that's interesting. So in Turkey, you feel like there's a more flexible model to, yes. to overcome the kind of traditional restraints. What about others? Do they feel like in their... Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, again, comparing technology area and banking area, there is no glass ceiling in technology area. If you can perform well in development, you can perform well. And you will never be chosen for the certain role in the company. If distinction and differentiator comes from kind of the relationship type qualifications. This is kind of the back zone. And then you will be chosen by your male colleagues in the places where sometimes you don't have access to. And more struggle you are and more active you are in persuading your male colleagues in your position, less likely you will be chosen for the certain role. So uh, in banking, it's, there is glass ceiling for female colleagues especially if you're a hard fighter for your own position in the boardroom. So when it comes to mentoring, if you allow mm -hmm. me, so I'll switch mm -hmm. to the second question. Yep. While I think mentoring is a very good tool to help others basically to get your best practices and be more developed for the future roles, I basically disagree that a female colleague should mentor female colleague. I'd rather consider mixed groups where male colleague should be mentoring the female colleague and vice versa in order to live in the world which consists of both parts. We shouldn't create the glass ceiling for male colleagues developing this functional vertical where female mentor is mentoring the female mentee and then actually cascading that down. So I, I strongly believe in mentoring but in the end of the day, we should live in the dual world with both genders having equal opportunities in any place, regardless, even when you cannot access the certain places where we get together. Rosa, I don't want to ask you about the glass ceiling because I feel as a former president, that's probably a bad thing to ask you. Um, but um, what about quotas? Quotas for women, would that help? I would say that uh, I'm the result of the quota policy also. As okay, well. that's, that's interesting. Uh, in the Soviet Union, we used to have this quota policy. And uh, for women, for uh, other ethnic groups, so, and it worked, it worked well. And uh, today, uh, in uh, our parliament, we, uh, we have uh, the quota also. And I do believe that if we'll not have this quota, then no women will be, will be in the parliament because of the proportional uh, type of elections and uh, who has the money for their winning elections. So with this regard, I would say that uh, quota is important. Uh, but in businesses? In, in, in business as well as in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, in business also, for example, in, the, in Europe, you are raising this issue on the quota uh, not uh, yeah, just on the presence of women in the boards of directors of big companies. So there is no women in the uh, or very few women. So in our case, I think also in energy sector, which is uh, the main uh, pillar uh, of our economy, we do not have any women in our uh, board of directors of uh, uh, number of companies. We do not have no women who is the head of energy company. So with this regard, I would uh, uh, push uh, this issue to have a quota to start with. And then probably, because this is club of boys and uh, you never will get in uh, for this uh, very, very uh, for narrow and close uh, uh, club. So uh, I would say that uh, this is important. And, uh, uh, I, uh, for, I came uh, from the Soviet time uh, to the post-Soviet time, and then uh, I was strong already, uh, visible in the politics, and uh, uh, I have seen a lot of uh, things in the politics, and then uh, uh, for struggling with other men, I was again uh, having sort of uh, such um, uh, experience. Uh, I came uh, the first among them, uh, so and that's why I became the president. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to call on uh, <laughs> I 
I just want to call on um, Nasa Narmanda, who's in the audience, who is the chief executive of Mont Polymet, uh, a, com a mining company in Mongolia. Um, I thought your experience would be interesting at this point because um, how, what, how would you see giving quotas for, for women in sectors like the mining, for example, on, on the boards of big mining companies in Mongolia? Well, I'm here for my mother, so I'll speak on behalf of her. <laughs> she's, again, uh, I agree with Rosa, she's a, a result of a quota as well. Mm -hmm. Back in the days when the Soviet system established our educational system, she was the... Um, one of the few people getting into the geological institutions in, in Moscow. And that's why she became a geological engineer. And um, you know, for the last 30 years, uh, she has been uh, working in the mining sector in a very intensely male-dominated industry in Mongolia, fighting with the other men. And you know, there's a lot of unfairness. Uh, many times she struggled through you know, the differences in uh, gender, the instability in, in the regulations, laws, the, the differential treatment towards the, you know, uh, the company. But today she is the first deputy, female deputy minister for the uh, uh, Ministry of Mineral Resources and Energy of Mongolia. Because of her qualifications, uh, she has been in the sector gaining experience. So um, I would agree with Rosa's point that the quota is very important in male-dominated cultures and, and industries. And you, as now the second generation woman leading this company, how do you think things have changed? Do you think that we really need quotas, that it will happen anyway by just women uh, <coughs> becoming uh, more educated rather than setting specific quotas? In the politics, I think it's very true that quotas do help women to be heard more. But in the business industry, I think uh, our generation is uh, becoming very competitive as to who's got more skills, who's more, more knowledge now who went to what university, how much have you gained knowledge in the previous institutions you've served. So I think in the private sector, I think uh, it's purely who can do what. It's equal opportunity, it needs to be um, skill tested qualifications, I think. Another question, one at the back. Our first man. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I, I'm uh, uh, Mevlid Katuk, a journalist. Uh, I was just listening to uh, Ms. Otombaeva in Chatmaz just two days ago. And actually she gave an uh, interesting example there, um, saying that uh, there are some high uh, positions held by the woman, like, uh, if I am wrong, please uh, correct me, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, the head of the Supreme Court or Central Bank Governor, all are women in Kyrgyzstan, as far well as I know. And uh, she also said that 20% of the parliament now um, is uh, occupied by women MPs. So I was wondering if we need to choose more women presidents to achieve that. And the second <laughs> question is, um, I guess one of the problems is uh, women not going into more entrepreneurial or IT-based uh, education uh, as a um, choice of discipline. And I guess that's one of the areas that needs to be encouraged. Uh, as mm -hmm. someone who spent many years in the academia, I know that they just choose certain areas and subjects um, that kind of prevent them from holding uh, higher positions or going into the business world. Thank you. Another question or a comment? Uh, down here. You just wait one second and we'll get the mic to you. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, Ms. Flah Lubna, uh, correspondent for the Morocco World News. So I'm basically from Morocco. Um, since the EBRD is moving to the North African region, so I deem it uh, relevant to raise the issue of women empowerment in, um, in North Africa. And you know that uh, in this area, I mean, the weight of patriarchy is uh, heavier than in Europe. I mean, uh, there are many restrictions. Uh, in Morocco, I think the situation is better than the other countries. There are so many reforms. So my question is for the Baroness... Uh, Yes, so uh, for women empowerment, so, uh, we know that in uh, North Africa we're faced with many challenges and hurdles. They're not only related to gender, uh, lack of resources, lack of financing. So do you think that the, um, the EBRD can uh, move or can tailor uh, its strategy to uh, fit the context in the region that has difference, uh, there are so many differences 
I mean, um, cannot be compared to the context in Europe. I mean, um, is, the EVA, uh, is the EBRD ready to tailor its programs to fit better to this region, uh, to fit the demands and the um, contextual elements that are different? I mean, the culture, uh, some religious elements also to fit better in this area. Thank you. Well, I would very much hope that the bank would do just that. Um, when I, in my opening remarks, I drew a distinction between the, area, the Eastern European and former, former Soviet bloc area that the bank has operated in and the area that you're talking about there. And clearly, the position of women um, is quite different in those areas. And um, if, if the bank fulfills its mandate, in terms of, of transition in, in economies and societies and democratization and so on, that has to be inclusive, and that's both genders. And so, therefore, I would expect the bank to target what it does appropriately uh, in the way that you say. And I think that um, uh, in, in terms of the politics within uh, these countries, too, um, it's extremely important that women are involved in the parliaments. And you can see from what well, you you've just heard how important it has been to have quotas and to make sure uh, that women are heard there, are represented there. It is transformative, uh, in my view, and my experience over a number of years. It's very important, and I do hope that the bank takes very seriously what you've just said. Do we have anyone here from the bank who can just answer to that point? Mm -hmm. Yes. You. Good evening, everyone. My name is Francis Malige. I'm the director for financial institutions for, among others, these countries in the Mediterranean. And uh, certainly we're looking at, uh, at this issue um, with a lot of attention. We've realized that uh, female participation in the workforce is uh, about half of what it is in the rest of the world. Um, and that's a big difference. And um, uh, when I was in Morocco recently, there was a conference when people were getting all excited about uh, regional integration. And they said, oh, making a regional integration in, the, in this region is, is, is 2% of GDP. Well, my answer to that is uh, making women participate in the workforce is 12. Yeah. So where do we start? Right. And uh, so we don't have answers, but we know that we'll have to find them and we're working hard to find them. Um, one of the issues in that region, and also in Turkey, is, uh, is lack of access to collateral. Because regardless of what one might think that uh, uh, you know, a bank is there to do the good of the world, or the Lord's work, as has been said, that's not what we're here for. We're here to make money. So we're here to lend money to projects that are going to enable us to make money and to get our money back. Part of that is, well, when there's not enough cash flow in the project, or where you're not sure, you take collateral. Now, I've heard that in Turkey, I don't know if the, the figure is true, I've heard it from the head of the Women's uh, Entrepreneur Federation, uh, women have 1% of the collateral available in the country. It's what? 1%. Two. Okay, two. <laughs> Good progress. It's doubled overnight. <laughs> Good progress, but that's still 48% short. That's still 48% short, and that's, yeah. that's massive, right? So. Coming up with a product, for example, where EBRD, when a bank, when a partner institution lends to a woman entrepreneur, <coughs> provides a guarantee that enables the bank to lend to that woman without the woman providing collateral, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, and that's the kind of things that we're, we're looking at, uh, at developing for that, uh, for that region. Mm -hmm. As you rightly said, it's very different from where we've been operating uh, this far. So we need to learn it. Um, we are fast learners, we have feet on the ground, and uh, you will see some such products coming out in, in the near future. Thank you very much. We literally are out of time. I can see that this is a... <laughs> people are grabbing the mic even as I speak. I, I know there are lots of questions. I think there will probably be opportunities a bit later, maybe around other sessions, where you can meet some of the participants in other settings. Um, I just wanted to finish by just asking um, our panellists in one word what they think the most important thing is or would have been for them at the beginning of their career to get started. Would it be education, networks, the kinds of things that we've been talking about? 
what is the single most important thing that, that they think we have to crack if we're going to get more women into the knowledge economy? Ayla. In my case, it was uh, education and self-confidence. I was the daddy's girl and I had all the self-confidence I needed, so I, I had the encouragement to do what I really wanted to do, but of course education as well. Olga? Uh, education for sure and aspiration that I can do anything I want. Yeah. <laughs> 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 education and also good child care. Um, <laughs> Over the, critical, heads nodding there. <laughs> over the critical period and you know down into the future my kids can look after me <laughs> rosa what about you uh, education for sure ambition but uh, i would uh, come to your uh, question that certainly we should have a networks these days we should have a networks and uh, i must stress that uh, learning about the energy sector i found that uh, there is a women uh, club within the of the uh, organization of regulators. Uh, of, um, so I think it's great that any professional group uh, of uh, gathered together, they should have inside women's networks. So this will be very important. Liliana. I would agree, uh, education for sure. And I would say persistence, be persistent. Persistence, uh, networks, childcare, those sound very familiar um, aspects to our working lives. Thank you very much, ladies. That's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you very much, ladies. It was Fascinating debate, not, and not only among you, but it was very nice interaction between you and the, and the audience. And I'm very happy that there were a lot of questions, not only to you, but there were questions raised and focused on the bank, on whether to support the technical museums or something like that. So I don't know whether I should come to the ex executive committee next week with this, uh, with this, uh, with this proposal. But that was also the nice questions about our engagement in the, in the new region, which is, of course, very, which is very different, very challenging, in fact, fascinating. So, but I would like to reassure you that the bank is ready to deal with this, uh, with this issue as, as well in the new, new region. So that's uh, not a region where the gender would be uh, forgotten. Uh, from the reason that it's very, very difficult. So that's not a case. So now, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we are coming to the second part of our uh, meeting today. And this is the, or the event, and this is the presentation of uh, Women in Business Awards. And I am uh, very pleased to inform you that we have three winners in three categories of award for outstanding achievements to present to be presented today. We have banking, we have entrepreneurship, and we have industry. So let me start with the first area, and that it's bank it is banking. And the Award for Outstanding Achievement in Banking goes to Madame Branka Pavlovic, CEO of Societe Generale Subsidiary in Montenegro, Podgorica, Podgorica Banka Societe Generale Group. Mrs. Pavlovic moved to this position from Societe Generale Serbia, and that is actually fantastic and a very success story. She was the first, first woman and the first non-French expert on CEO position among all Societe Generale subsidiaries. She has helped transform a non-profitable bank with decreasing market share into a client-oriented and the most profitable and excellently performing bank of the market. It's a pleasure for me to present this award to you, so join me, please here on the stage. Mrs. Pavlovich, it's Thank a pleasure you. to me to 
hand over Thank you so this much. award and <laughs> Thank you. Are you happy? Okay, fine. <laughs> and now, please, if may I ask you for some words, for some words. Uh, I just want to thank to the bank, EBRD, to recognize what has been doing in very small country in South uh, Europe and uh, to encourage all of you who maybe think it is not possible it is possible to have a marriage, to kids, uh, to work uh, hard and to achieve a result and then someone like EBRD to recognize that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks again. All the best. Thank you very much. After banking, we are coming to the second category. Uh, of award for outstanding achievements in entrepreneurship. The award goes to Mrs. Branka Radovanovic. Mrs. Radovanovic, an electrical engineer, established a private company, PS Tech, for ICT solutions and software development together with her colleagues in 1996. PS, PS Tech references include some of the biggest ICT companies in the world. Mrs. Radovanovic managed to become a successful businesswoman, leading the company in one of the most prospective as well as challenging sector of the economy. So I would, it will be a pleasure for me to invite you here. Please come on the stage. <laughs> Mrs. Radovanovic. It's a pleasure for me to hand it over our award. Congratulations. And please, some words would be very nice from you. From you. Firstly, I want to thank uh, to EBRD for this uh, award. It's uh, award means recognition not only for my work, uh, but for the work of my team for PS Tech, the leading ICT company in Serbia, and also for Serbia, as a contribution, as a country with a big contribution is education and uh, with uh, many business possibilities. Um, it's possible, I want to tell also, that it's possible to be engineer, to be a mother, to be wife, and to be grandmother. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> with, my, with respect. <laughs> The third award for outstanding achievement in the industry sector goes to Mrs. Garamia Tseden. Unfortunately, as we know, Mrs. Tseden is not able to join us today, but her daughter, Mrs. Narmandak Munkansen, is here to accept the award on her behalf. Let me say a few words about uh, Mrs. Tseden, just to repeat what you said in a nutshell. She's a, geolog she's a geological engineer who established Monpolymet company in 1992, a leading national enterprise in Mongolia with a primary focus on mining. Today, the company has expanded into four sister companies in construction, mine, uh, mi mineral exploration, rehabilitation, and construction material production with over 500 employees. Mrs. Seden has been working in the mining industry for 29 years and has implemented numerous profitable projects. Mrs. Munkansan, may I ask you to come on behalf of your mother to come here and to take over the award. Some words sure. it would be very nice. Thank you. Very much honored to be receiving this award on behalf of my mother. She couldn't be here with us presently um, due to our very de demanding responsibility as the Deputy Minister of the Natural Resources of Mongolia. 
Indeed, it's a very busy time for us Mongolians as we celebrate our 80th year anniversary of our mining sector, organizing international expositions, forums, and conferences. As the new deputy minister, my mother takes her responsibility very seriously, making sure that our vast natural resources are managed well so that the prudent management creates sustainable growth that improves the welfare of the citizens and protects the environment. Our family is grateful that the bank acknowledged my mother's hard work, despite many unfairness in a very male-dominant culture, and despite the loss of my father and my sister's sickness, my mother fought her way through and led the industry with best business standards, focusing on helping communities in need in rehabilitating over 400 hectares of mined area in Mongolia. She created a company from 10 to 500 strong, all with improved welfare and ready to carry on her focus on responsible mining, green technology, community development, and sustainable growth. And she still continues to create extraordinary example to us, the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, and please give your mother our best. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of this, of this event, Women in Business, Women in Business, Women in Business Meeting, Women in Business, uh, business uh, Panel. Uh, I think that uh, we have got a very good, very good event this year, and it's my pleasure to invite you to come to Istanbul, where the annual meeting will be held next next year, and I'm pretty sure that we will we will keep on this on this tradition, and this kind of panel will be organized will be organized again. So thank you very much for all your inputs. Thank you very much uh, to thank you our panelists. Thank you moderator, and have a nice have a nice evening. And I'm pretty sure that we can carry on our debate. Uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, room at the at the reception which the bank has prepared for you. All the best. See you in Istanbul.